Hello there. Welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Albert Marke. I'm the instructor for this course, International Finance, and uh, we're going to have fun. Uh, to begin with, this is a course for the third year level in the Department of Finance, Accounting, and a little bit of Marketing. Uh, in the Faculty of uh, Economic Sciences and Management here in Unilag. International Finance is an interesting course and we're looking at various issues that happen or influence business domestically as well as internationally. As you might know, we live in a globalized society, a globalized community. There is international trade and there is no country that can be an island by itself. And therefore, it is paramount for us to address the problems and challenges that we face when we do business with other countries. So we'll be looking at various issues to help us understand what is international finance. And so we're going to look at how is this course going to help us understand these challenges. For example, questions that we'll be answering will be, how does international finance interact with international monetary systems? These are payment systems of the international space where businesses will be able to interact and pay off for goods. We'll be also looking at different sources of finance for businesses at home and also in the global market. What's the role of international financial institutions so that they can facilitate international trade and business? We will also looking at purchasing power parity. When you're looking at your own currency, how powerful is it? How relevant is it when it comes to international business? And then we'll be looking at foreign exchange transactions determination of foreign exchange and what's the rate for each currency vis-a-vis -vis the other currencies that we trade with. And also, uh, we'll also look at um, international money markets, uh, the bond market, uh, all those other areas. How is this important in uh, doing business? So to begin with, we will look at the outline. What are we going to cover in this course? First of all, we'll just look at the overview of international finance or international macroeconomics. Then we'll look at foreign exchange. How is, what is foreign exchange? How do businesses handle foreign exchange? Thirdly, what is the rate of exchange? Once we've understood or appreciated that in a global space, we have to deal with foreign exchange. Therefore, how do we determine the rate of exchange? We'll be also looking at the balance of payments, imports and exports, the disequilibriums that result from imports and exports, and how do we solve such problems? We'll be looking at things to do with floating currencies, uh, Currencies keep on moving up and down. They fluctuate because of different uh, areas. How are we addressing the floating issues? We also look at uh, the global financial markets, looking at the bond market, the money markets, the, the equity market, and how businesses are able to raise funds so that they be able to do or carry out business. So. I'm glad that you're here. I'm going to give you a couple of instructions since this is a model delivered online for you to be able to use them. Uh, first of all, make sure that the environment you are, there are no distractions. Quiet place, um, away from disturbances, away from children, away from traffic, such that you're able to be able to get what we're doing here. Secondly, uh, your individual assignments will be delivered online. You have to do them and upload them in the space uh, cloud there. Thirdly, 
uh, your assessment for CAT, continuous assessment tests, and end exam. Be prepared to do them on a face-to-face -face basis. You will have to attend uh, the exam and participate, participate in doing the exam. And thirdly, uh, you'll be following all the other instructions that are being given such that at the end of the course you're able to have satisfied all the requirements either online or face to face. So here we are. Welcome once again. This is Albert, your instructor for international finance. To begin with, with unit one, we're looking at the international finance overview. What does this all uh, deal with? First of all, we'll have to look at the meaning and the scope of international finance. What does international finance mean? And what's, what are the boundaries for international finance? Secondly, we will consider the features of international finance. What makes international finance international finance? How do we differentiate it from domestic finance? Thirdly, we look at the various businesses, international business activities that take place in the global space. Very interesting stuff there. We'll also look at the various methods that we do international business activities with. And lastly, we'll conclude with the international monetary systems. So, let's go on. International finance is also known as international macroeconomics. From the field of economics, by the way, I'm an economist. From the field of economics, we understand that when we study the economy, if we are looking at the single units, then it is a micro analysis. But when we consider the aggregates, the general uh, elements of an analysis, then it is a macroeconomics. And international finance, we are actually crossing the borders. We're going to deal with international business activities. We're going to deal with international companies. We're dealing with foreign exchange. We're dealing with um, imports and exports. We're dealing with, with money markets. So the analysis is a macro analysis. We are looking at how countries interact with one another when it comes to business. And therefore, we call this as international macroeconomics. Furthermore, this deals with the monetary interactions that occur between two or more countries, between two or more different international business. We deal with two or more countries or two or more multinational companies, companies that do businesses across the world. It also deals with foreign direct investment. You have your investors going overseas to other countries to invest in different countries. You're dealing with currency exchange, you're dealing with financial management and such and such things. The scope will include things to do with the dynamics of foreign exchange. Some countries uh, deal with a demand and supply or what we call a flexible exchange regime. Others, they have a control system. Others, they mix this uh, monetary system. So we're going to deal with the dynamics of foreign exchange. We're going to deal with foreign investment as well as international trade. How are these two related and how do they affect one another? We also have uh, international projects that are carried out by multilateral, multilateral institutions. So how does this fit into the space of international finance, uh, global markets, international investments? Uh, international finance also deals with capital flows coming into the country or capital flights going out of the country for many or various reasons. And lastly, the trade deficits, which is actually the key component of international finance, the imports and exports, the movement of goods and services across borders 
gives us the trade. And that covers the scope. Going forward, I would like to let you know what is international business. This is conducting business with more, at least two or more business entities or countries. And therefore, when you're looking at international business, the scope, the space deals with are beyond the borders. You're buying and selling goods and services across the borders. So you'll be dealing with various countries. For example, Rwanda will be trading with Kenya. Rwanda will be trading with China. Rwanda will be trading with Senegal. That is international business. You're buying and selling, you're importing and exporting goods and services across the borders. And in which areas? We have marketing. We can do this in manufacturing. We can also do this in mining, farming, and many, many other sectors of the country where business can be done internationally. So at the end of the day, international business is a business practice that is done at an international level. It is not domestic, but rather internationally. Moving on, multinational corporations, or what we call MNCs, are the key or principal players in international finance. These are companies that have been established across borders. They have the parent company or the mother company at home and then they open subsidiary units or facilities across the borders. For example, you would have a company such as the Bank, Bank of Kigali situated having its headquarters in Kigali while it has subsidiary units across the region, maybe in Uganda, in Burundi, in Congo. That basically makes it to be a multinational corporation. Examples of multinational corporations in Rwanda include, and many of them come from Kenya by the way, include uh, in the banking sector, we have Equity Bank, we have INM, we have KCB or what we call BPR nowadays, we have international uh, faces such as uh, Volkswagen that is based in Germany. They have subsidiaries here in Rwanda. So what we are saying is multinational corporation is a company that has its headquarters in its domestic territory and then it has subsidiaries across other countries. And so they are the principal participants of international finance. They are the principal actors and players. They are the ones that play the international game. So there we have business, international business, and multinational corporations. What makes international finance international finance? What are the features? How will you identify the various characteristics of international finance? And I can give you a couple of them. First one, and the most obvious one, is foreign exchange risk. Since international business or international finance deals with buying and selling goods and services across the borders with other countries, we have the element of foreign exchange risk. This is because each country and each company coming from its home territory operates on a legal tender or on a currency that is at home. For example, a company from Rwanda will deal with Rwandan francs. And if it is doing business with another country, such as China, they will be dealing with Chinese yuan. So the interaction between these two countries and two currencies will be Rwandan franc versus Chinese yuan. In doing business, we expect to have a financial risk. 
And this basically is in the sense of foreign exchange risk. And so there are businessmen and women who are trading between Rwanda and, and China will be trying to address how do they how do they deal with the foreign exchange risk because the currencies will fluctuate so that is one there is a definite risk of volatility of fluctuations and that is critical secondly international finance involves long distance i just mentioned Rwanda and China. These are countries in different continents. Rwanda is in the great continent of Africa and China is in Asia. And in between here, there, is, there are countries and there is a sea, the Indian Ocean. So there is a distance between the countries that do business. And this distance can bring in its dynamics, its complexities, basically in terms of doing business, in terms of payments, in terms of receipts. How does this, uh, countries have to address this? This is one of the features of international finance, a distance between countries. Thirdly, we have different currencies. In the world, we can easily name around 195 countries and each country has its own sovereignty each country has its own constitution and within those ethos and pethos they are able to come up with their own currency each country has its own fiscal and monetary policies and therefore this is one interesting aspect number four we have different rates of interests because each country is in a different economic zone or economic pocket they have their own challenges they have their own uh, issues to deal with within the country the economy of the country will be different from another economy for example right now in rwanda 2023 uh, the interest rate will vary from that which is in Tanzania. The interest rates will vary from that which are existent in Japan. So each country has their own interest rates. And this is because of the internal differentials, such as inflation, such as foreign exchange, such as um, deficits from balance of payments. Each country has their own uniqueness and therefore they will have different interest rates to be able to manage uh, the economy. Number five, we're looking at exchange controls. Each country has borders and so we have exchange control centers or existence of exchange control. How do currencies interact with one another? What are the policies in place because of the different unique uh, situations that are to that particular country or various countries? So there are different protocols that will influence the exchange controls of finances and all. Uh, number six, we have what we call uh, legal systems. As we said, we have 195 countries. These have their own constitutions and therefore their own different legal systems. The rules in Rwanda are different from those that are existing in China. Remember, China is a communist economic system, while Rwanda, we have a mixed economic system. So you can see there are different laws. Uh, when it comes to economic crimes, each country will have their own different laws on handling these economic crimes. And so the legal system is different. Some could be British, others could be American, others could be otherwise. But what we are saying is there exists different legal systems in different countries. Number seven, political risk. Each country comes from a political setting. And as we've said, 
we have different mixed, uh, we have different economic systems. And these are involved or they influence businesses. So the political risk is critical. Right now, if you go, if you consider Syria, Syria is in turmoil. If you look at uh, other countries uh, in the neighboring here, Congo has its own uh, internal issues. Uh, so the political environment will determine the level of business that is happening. So it is important for us to uh, do the political risk uh, uh, management. You have to ask, is this place, um, does it, is the economy okay? Is the political space, is there security? Um, how come other companies are existing there? This is an indication that things are good there. So the political space will determine how and where you actually expand or take your businesses. Number eight, uh, expanded opportunity sets. Because of international finance, uh, companies have the advantage of forging to newer lands. They have uh, the, the, the adventure to go and start businesses elsewhere. Um, many companies from Kenya have come to uh, Rwanda uh, and they're expanding across the region. Look at Ecobank. Ecobank is a, is, a, is, a, is a bank from a small country in West Africa, Togo. But it has spread its wings across the face of Africa. This is because of the opportunities presented in international finance. And so we have American companies all over the world. We have Chinese companies all over the world. Uh, we can talk of Japan, Korea. And, uh, South Korea. There are many companies across the world just because of the opportunity to expand and explore and do business elsewhere. Number nine, there are market imperfections that exist in each country. As we said, the political stability or the political risk, we have the different legal systems, we have different uh, interest rates, all these variables will present market imperfections. Uh, the distances between countries. Uh, if I am to do business with a country such as Japan, or let's go further east, Fiji, and I am in Rwanda, chances are that because of the time difference, by the time I'm getting into a bank to do business, People or my clients in Fiji are sleeping. It is night time. So how do we solve these problems? So these market imperfections, they vary. There are areas, there are countries which are in the northern uh, sphere where it is so hot. So they don't do business during daytime because it is very hot. That time they've gone into uh, their houses, they are resting. While in Africa, since we enjoy a tropical climate, we can do business all through. So therefore, we have different market imperfections. Things to do like tax systems. Every country has its own tax regime, which are different from others. We have cultural influences and nuances that will, uh, that will influence how people do business. So these are market imperfections. That gives you the various features of international finance. Going forward, we want to look at why is it important to do international finance, especially with regards to multinational corporations. Multinational corporations, as we already considered, are companies that are established at home, they have a parent company, and they have subsidiaries across the world. Examples, uh, Volkswagen, Equity, uh, PwC, many, many other countries, many, many other uh, companies. Now, 
the importance of international finance for such um, entities, number one is that it helps the company and the finance managers of that company to be able to decide how do they deal with international events that will actually affect the firm and its operations. How do they deal with expanding opportunities? How do they deal with uh, political events? How do they deal with money markets? So it is important that uh, each company will address these issues so that it is able to place itself or insulate itself from international events that could affect the operations of the company. Secondly, international finance helps company to recognize how the firm will be affected by the movement, for example, of exchange rates, uh, the movement of interest rates, the movement of inflation rates across uh, the markets, the movement of asset values, you know, either crypto or otherwise in the stock market. This helps, it is an indicator for the multinational corporations to be able to now determine and say, okay, if we are having these differentials fluctuating so much, then there is a risk attached to this. And so uh, investment for expansion or otherwise will be slowed down. So international finance uh, helps inform these multinational corporations on what to do, especially in this global situation. Let me give you a couple of multinational corporations examples. Number one, we have uh, AT&T. This is the American telephone and telegraph uh, a company that deals with, uh, it is in the telecom space. We have the uh, Barishan Moto uh, Way. This is uh, BMW. We have Mercedes, we have L'Oreal from France, we have Mitsubishi Corporation from Japan, uh, there is General Motors from US, so many countries that we can mention. We have uh, retailers such as McDonald's, we have Pizza, we have YouTube, we have uh, Coca-Cola, Apple, many, many countries have their businesses or multinational corporations operating across the world. And so uh, the products that we buy, sometimes we might not notice or realize that these are actually being brought to us by multinational corporations. Um, I would like to also let you know uh, the role of the financial manager or finance manager rather in these multinational corporations. And quickly, I'll just mention that Broadly, we have the acquisition uh, problem and the investment problem. Our finance managers for these big, big companies would want to deal with these two uh, areas, acquisition and investment. And this is dealing with funds. So they will be able to look at how do they acquire more companies, or how do they invest in newer spaces? And this will be able to help them expand their role in doing business, either in the emerging economies or wherever they are already established. So attached there, you'll be able to see uh, what are these roles, what are the functions of finance managers such that they are able to actually do or give a good input for their, for their companies. Things to do with the investment banking, things such as risk management, uh, credit management, uh, tax analysis, and such and such that are important. Um, it is interesting to also cover why would multinational corporations actually want to do business across borders? Why do companies go international? Why uh, is Volkswagen in Rwanda? Why is equity in Rwanda? 
why would the uh, uh, Bank of Kigali having operations in Congo or Burundi, such and such, uh, questions that we can, can raise up. Why do companies go international? The first one is to exploit raw materials in these foreign countries. Multinational corporations that deal with raw materials, that deal with the manufacturing sector, would actually go across borders to exploit the available and easy cost-benefit raw materials that will help them produce their goods and then be able to sell or export them. So there's the element of exploiting raw materials. Africa is a rich country in minerals, in raw materials. And that is why we have so many manufacturing countries in Africa to be able to exploit the materials that is available. Secondly, there is cheaper and more efficient means of production across other countries. So countries, uh, uh, multinational corporations will therefore, you know, do a market research and be able to see that, aha, <coughs> the labor um, component as a factor of production in Africa is much cheaper as opposed to the one in US. We have very many countries, uh, very many companies actually uh, doing business, set up shop in China. This is because the labor in China is cheaper. Uh, other, com other companies have also set up companies in, in, uh, in China, basically because the technology as a factor of production is cheaper. So multinational corporations would go international to take advantage of the cheap factors of production. Land is cheap in Africa. Companies will be here. Number three, the technological advancement in foreign countries presents an opportunity for manufacturing countries, for multinational corporations to come in and take care of business. So looking at uh, uh, countries in the Europe, uh, European Union, look at uh, America, and especially in China, and going east to Japan, the technological advancement in these economies sets up the environment or the ground for companies to go and invest there. And that is why in China you have, uh, in a province like Guangdong, you have easily 320 million manufacturing companies. And that component includes many, many investors, many, many multinational corporations that are not Chinese, but they are foreign multinational corporations. So technological advancement is key. Right now, we are moving into the fourth industrial revolution. And this is a revolution of AI, of artificial intelligence. Where we are going, we are going in a globalized economy where we are going to use AI. So technology is key. It is actually the latest factor of production besides land, labor, entrepreneurship, and um, what we call capital. So technology is key. Number four, benefit of favorable tax regimes. Uh, I may take a quick example. Uh, in Africa, the country Rwanda has done quite well to be able to position itself as a destination of investor in, uh, investors to come and invest. So they will have, therefore, to make sure that the investment space is conducive. They will have to see how do they make it easy for investors to come, register their businesses, and in a very short time, finish it. They don't have to move across different ministries and departments, but it is just a one-stop shop where everything is done within three days 
Rwanda Development Board will have your company and it is even possible to register this company online. Such incentives and especially tax regime, a flexible taxation regime will be very attractive to be able to bring in or uh, invite investors to come and invest. So the regulatory systems, the regulatory environment is key in attracting multinational corporations. Number five, people or the businessmen will just want to spread the risk that is involved in business and in finance. When a multinational company comes to Rwanda and the investors list their company on the Rwanda Stock Exchange, what they are basically doing is they are spreading the finance risk. They are spreading the business risk. They will bring in the capital and the business partners from Rwanda will bring in the land, the labor, or the technology, whatever factor of production, but basically to spread out the financial risk, to spread out the business risk, such that if there is any challenge, then it is shared, but also profitability will also be shared. So to spread business and financial risk is another reason why companies go international. Number six is to service local markets. There are areas, the emerging economies, that do not have new products. Products from America, products from China, products from Japan. They are not yet in uh, economies such as Africa. So companies will bring in their products so that they can sell them to the consumers in these economies. For example, KFC, it is a Kentucky Fried Chicken uh, retail company, and it is a franchise, by the way. It is making inroads to Rwanda. And so, because, yes, there is chicken in Rwanda, but the product as delivered or as brought out by KFC, it is unique. This brings or makes it attractive to bring it to the Rwandan market. You have different financial services being brought in by different banks, different uh, insurance companies. They are bringing in their services. For example, we have what we call the, the Muslim banking. This is a new area, new innovation. They're bringing in their services that have been uh, that are different, they cut across the sector. And so, uh, bring in the new service so that your company can actually sell and have to do business. Moving on, we're looking at what are, what is international business activities. The types of international business activities will be foreign direct investment and passive investment, or what we call portfolio investment. FDI is basically having companies coming to invest in a country. These are foreign companies coming in to invest in a country and they will have a management interest. So they, they are interested, they are, they are involved in the activities of the company. Portfolio investment on the other hand is a passive investment. This is where companies will actually invest in the uh, Rwanda Stock Exchange, for example. So they invest in financial assets whereby they do not have much management interest. So we do have two international business activities. That is foreign direct activities, foreign direct investment and foreign portfolio investment. Now getting into international business methods, we have a couple of them and I'll just quickly summarize through. The first method is licensing. Licensing is a method of doing international business where a firm is given the license to operate or to sell either the 
patents or the trademark or the copyright of that brand. And so they pay a fee for that service. Secondly, we have a franchise or what we call franchising. This is a method of distributing products and services. So the franchiser who owns the franchise will sell the franchise to the franchisee for a fee. An example could be McDonald's or KFC. Thirdly, we have what we call uh, joint ventures. Joint ventures is where two or three companies will come together and they bring in their strengths or their comparative advantage into the business. So they, they, they will bring either, for example, you have companies from Kenya doing business with companies in Rwanda. And a good example in Rwanda is we have what we call uh, Bralirwa and Minimex, South African company with Bralirwa doing business together. That is a joint venture. Number four is to establish business new foreign subsidiaries across the countries. Basically, go do your market research and identify the business you can do and start all over from there. Number five, management contracts. Management contracts are where firms are given uh, the space or they agree to operate for another country for another company rather and so they manage the services on behalf of another company number six is assembly operations this is where a company will bring in together prefabricated uh, parts of uh, a unit and then assemble them together and this happens a good example is uh, volkswagen in rwanda where they bring in prefabricated parts of their cars and assemble them in Rwanda. Now, those are six examples of international business methods. Going forward, we're going to look at the international monetary systems that are important in uh, international finance. Largely, they are four, or broadly rather. Number one, we have the gold standard. The gold standard was operational from 1876 to 1913, just before World War I. And basically, they used gold in trading. So international trade was based on or was financed by gold. Secondly, we had the interwar year period. This is a period between the World War I and the World War II, where a new system that was called interwar years was uh, used for the movement of goods and service to clear businesses. Then after World War II in 1945, all the way to 1977, uh, the, the League of Nations came together and they formed what we call the Bretton Woods system. And this Bretton Woods system was responsible in uh, making the US dollar as the reserve currency and it was backed by gold. That's 1945 to 1972. Then if you can remember, history tells us that the President Richard Nixon was the one who took us off the Bretton Woods system when he announced that uh, they are removing the US currency as the world reserve currency and therefore it ushered in the flexible exchange regime system. And this is the one we're using currently, whereby foreign exchange, payments for goods and services, and even the price policy of goods and services across the world is de determined by demand and supply for goods and services. So that brings us to the end of this unit. We've looked at uh, what is international finance, the features of international finance. We've covered why do companies go international. We've looked at international business activities, the business methods, and as well as the international monetary system. So uh, as you go through this, prepare to do your quizzes online such that you'll be able to test yourself 
on the Lord. Thank you. See you on the next unit.